Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to UKIO Online. Um, I'm Matt Dunn. I'm Head of Radiation Physics uh, at Nottingham. Uh, it's good to so many, see so many uh, registrations for, uh, for this session. Uh, I'm told we've got over 500 registrations, which is brilliant. Uh, and that's about 100 more than Matt Hancock's daily briefing today, um, so I'm told. Uh, this session's uh, called How to Comply with IRMA for Patient Doses. We've got three excellent speakers this evening. Um, the first speaker is Cliff Double uh, from CQC, and he's going to talk about what the uh, what the inspector inspects or expects. Sorry. Second, we've got Paul Charnock, uh, who's going to talk about the IPM Report 88, which is about uh, DRLs and how to set them. And thirdly, we've got Maria Murray from uh, SCOR, uh, who's going to talk about what radiographers should know um, about DRLs. We're going to have a live Q&A session at the end, uh, and if you've got any questions as we go through, uh, please can you put them in the submit a question box, uh, and I'll be gathering all of those up. Uh, we might provide some answers as we go through, uh, but I'll try to uh, assimilate them all, and then we'll take the questions from people uh, at the end of the session. Okay, so it's time to move to our first speaker. So we move to Cliff Double from CQC, uh, and he's going to tell us what an inspector expects. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the session and welcome to my presentation. My name's Cliff Double. I'm a, an IRMA inspector at CQC. Um, I've been asked to give a talk today on patient doses and DRLs, what an inspector expects. Conflicts, uh, I have no conflicts and nothing to declare. So the focus of the talk is going to be on DRLs, really, rather than patient doses more widely. Um, I'm hoping that you'll get an improved familiarity and understanding of diagnostic reference levels. Um, we're going to discuss what they mean and what they're for, where to find national published values, what you need to do to derive your own DRLs, what we expect about DRLs when we conduct an inspection at your hospital, and what we said about DRLs in our published reports. We've taken enforcement action and uh, and will still do say, uh, we'll give you some examples of what has happened if you don't comply. And finally, we'll finish off with a couple of slides on uh, what good looks like, some examples from drawn from recent inspections. So diagnostic reference levels is a bit of a mouthful. I'll be talking about DRLs, national DRLs, European DRLs, locally derived LDRLs, and maybe from time to time touch on radiotherapy imaging RT DRLs. Although, just to be clear, that IRMA doesn't require you to set an established uh, radiotherapy DRLs. They're given a different name to try and distinguish them. Uh, they're called radiotherapy dose reference levels. And in order to fill up a little bit of space at the bottom of the slide, I've included a link to the national DRLs at, uh, at the .gov website given. So the definition of a DRL, the regulation too uh, sets out a number of definitions, including this for diagnostic reference levels. Uh, you can read it yourself there. It's in, it's in black and white in the regs themselves. It makes reference to standard sized individuals and standard phantoms for broadly defined types of equipment. The, the phantom bit is interesting. As far as I'm aware, no one uses that option for setting DRLs. Uh, as well as that definition, though I have, if you like, my own working definition. Um, I'll read it out. A, a DRL is a dose value which is a benchmark for patient dose, where the basic assumption is that the dose has produced a diagnostically acceptable or optimised image and the DRL is a single dose figure derived from that distribution of individual patient doses for a specific examination or protocol, one which can be compared against other similarly derived dose values. It's a tool to optimization and one and a benchmark to allow comparison with others. So further on in the in the IRMA regulations, we find uh, DRLs is mentioned uh, for, uh, elsewhere in the section on employer duties, Regulation 6. Uh, regard must be had to national and European DRLs for non-interventional procedures. 
and you're to establish DRLs for patients and health screening exposures for asymptomatic individuals and for non-medical imaging, if, if that's practicable, and to make them available to an operator. Later on in the same regulation, it requires a review of DRLs whenever consistently exceeded and take corrective action where appropriate, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that later. Regulation 12 on optimization requires you to adhere to DRL procedures. Regulation 14, um, the medical physics expert is to be involved in optimization and application in the use of DRLs. So it ties in optimization and DRLs and you'll find this throughout the regulations. Schedule 2F is a requirement for there to be a procedure for DRLs. In support of the IRMA regulations, there are IRMA guidance produced by the Department of Health some years ago. Exposures must still be optimised. Simply keeping patient dose levels below national and European levels isn't sufficient. It tells us more about reviews at local level and what to do when consistently exceeded and suggests setting new DRLs or training might be examples of corrective action. Finally, I've said that the requirement to adhere to DRLs with respect to the typical values for exposure shouldn't be applied to individual exposures. I'll have something more to say about that on the very last slide, so you'll have to wait a little bit longer. So where do we start? Well, you could do worse than starting by having a discussion with your local physics department. I mean, your MPE, your medical physics expert, should be aware of your inventory and your practice. Protocols should be optimised and coded so you can make sense of your dose analysis. You need to agree methodologies available for local patient dose surveys and, and agree priorities and resources for the survey and the analysis. In other words, you need to know where you start, who's going to do what and who's going to drive it forward. Of course, once you've got a lot of data, you'll need to crunch the numbers to develop the local DRL and compare with your national DRL. You'll need to have that value, whatever you adopt. You'll need to have the value adopted by the organisation via governance arrangements such as that from the uh, Radiation Protection Committee. And you'll need to look ahead. You'll need to look at arrangements for the review and establish when corrective action is required. And I've come up with a couple of additional examples of on top of what we heard in the in the guidance just a short while ago, you can clearly re-optimise, check that the, the protocols are optimised. And if equipment is optimised and your operators are trained, well, there may be only one option. It may be that the equipment is elderly, needs to be replaced. Um, so maybe time to put it on the risk register or uh, start arrangements for its replacement. It's very tempting, I think, to look at all the arrangements within radiology, which is in your sphere of influence, but maybe outside of the department there are other areas which will also need to have DRLs established. And the big uh, factor there, I think, is, is cardiology. We will often follow the dose and we'll want to prioritise high-dose modalities over low-dose, so please don't forget cardiology. But the same would be also true for theatre, mobiles, dental and all the other areas where there are medical exposures um, outside of uh, the main radiology department. So, how do you do it? The most common approach in my experience is that um, there will be a RIS export of dose data. This could lead to uh, dose values for many thousands of examinations um, but having thousands of examinations is good because it usually means you can ignore patient weight, which is one of the big variables of, uh, of the determining the dose. But the MPE will help you. Their analysis will allow corrections to uh, DAP values if they think that's required using their equipment QA data. The analysis of the distribution should lead them to exclude null values and outliers. Uh, that might be the top and bottom 5%. You might simply want to do a visual or common sense check 
um, some have excluded those which are ten times bigger than the existing DRL, but there'll be a way to exclude outliers. You'll need to crunch the numbers and derive um, a local DRL which might be based on mean or median distributions, and this is something of a, um, a I'll call it a, a, um, a contentious issue, but um, th again the physics, the physics department will help you with this. Often people will want to propose a new DRL if it's different by more than 20% from the existing value. But of course, wh whatever you do will need governance, approval and oversight. After the RIS approach, you may be lucky to have a dose management system. The DMS can provide all the same benefits for big data for all the connected modalities as the RIS approach had. You can provide dose data and update it in real time on the dashboard. Pen and paper is the final option, of course. Photocopies of the daybook, um, I've seen a few of those in my time, often resulting in DRLs derived from much smaller patient numbers. People talk of about 50, at least 50 data points in for adult exposures and at least 20 for paediatric still needing to calculate the median or mean for every examination, but this approach is subject to greater variability to patient weight. Arrangements in nuclear medicine are usually, in my experience, slightly more straightforward. The RSAC people have determined the maximum activity should be used as the national DRL for adults, with smaller values scaled down by weight for paediatric patients, um, again according to RSAC or European Association protocols. But we shouldn't forget in nuclear medicine it's not just about the activity. We should also make reference to CT and hybrid imaging, particularly in PET for the CT could be based on attenuation, correction, localization or diagnosis. There might be a fair bit to do. Examination activities should be listed. My colleagues say review date according to the Schedule 2F procedure. Provide evidence of regular audit against DRLs, in particular if the local activity is routinely different from the RSAC DRL. Radiotherapy imaging. As I said earlier, IRMA doesn't require you to establish radiotherapy DRLs for Im imaging. They've been recently collated and published for CT treatment planning exposures, and a similar effort is underway to collate dose values for verification exposures. They're not published yet, but when they are, they too will be a helpful tool for comparison and benchmarking of local practice. I've called this slide Approaches and Controversies. One of the controversies is, is how we establish DRLs when weight is very important for patients. ONS data for average weight of man and women describe the weights as 84 and the 70 kilograms respectively. The regulations themselves talk about groups of standard sized individuals. Well, there's a 14 kilogram difference there. I'm really hoping that the National DRL Working Party will help to give us some advice on how to square that circle. Um, in anticipation that the forthcoming guidance from IPEM and the DRL Working Party will address um, issues about whether you want to measure patient weight, whether perhaps you can infer a patient weight from perhaps CT contrast load, whether an experienced radiographer can eyeball a patient to, to make sure that they're within a certain weight category. Um, maybe there's ac access to patient notes or maybe measure on the day. Or maybe none of this is necessary if you have uh, sufficient data points in your survey. Moving on to B, paediatric uh, patients. Um, historically, we've seen paediatric DRLs described in terms of weight bands or age bands. And again, it seems to be entirely variable and at the choice of the hospital whether they choose one or the other. Again, I'm hoping that the working party will give us some advice. Whether to adopt a mean of the distribution of doses or a median again might depend on whether we're using old guidance or forthcoming IPEM guidance um, 
take advice from your physicist would be my suggestion. This is one that's not bothered me, but it, it, I'm aware that it, it could be a particular issue is when you have a mix of technologies within your department. For example, old CR systems and a brand new DR, or in CT, if you've got a brand new 256 slice iterative reconstruction CT and a seven or eight year old machine 16 slice with filtered back projection, you're going to get a wildly different uh, dose result with the new scanner compared to the old and that puts you in a difficult position if your dose survey accounts for the same examination from both scanners. I'm aware that some centres have moved to moving to a, a room specific local DRL and that isn't required in the regulations. You'll be aware that um, I've been talking throughout this talk on national and European levels completely in the other direction, a high dose, a high number of dose values contributing to the national and European levels compared to the room specific. Our expectation during an IRMA inspection? Well, we will make inquiries about optimization, patient dose recording and DRLs as you might expect. We'll ask you to share your DRL procedure and we'll usually ask for this up front as we will do pretty much all the employer's procedures which are listed in Schedule 2. We'll ask who's involved in the dose audit, who does what and how frequently. We'll ask how they're adopted or ratified locally. We'll ask how do you know if your DRLs are consistently exceeded? How frequently do you review your doses? And we'd expect to see evidence of corrective action if DRLs are consistently exceeded. We'll ask what your approach is for patient weight and how you've derived DRLs for paediatric patients and whether you've me used means or medians or how you accommodate the technology mix which we described just uh, in the last slide. In terms of the frequency, you may want to focus on CT in one year, fluoro and interventional and theatre exposures in the next, plain film, mobile and dental, perhaps all in a three year cycle. Um, that will be down to you. In preparation for this talk, I did a quick review of where DRLs have had a mention within our own published materials, and I'll start with this, which was a, a publication uh, a couple of years ago following our work in uh, children's hospitals inspections, and I've provided a link there to it if you want to follow that up. Uh, most trusts in the programme had adopted uh, national DRLs for paediatric examinations. Some had adopted local DRLs, and adopted an age-based system with the remainder using a weight-based approach. All of them had used, used, as far as I can remember, a RIS download approach, um, perhaps with one exception, which had used a DMS. Some hospitals had not set any paediatric DRLs and were unable to demonstrate special attention in optimising exposures to children as required by Regulation 12.8. So I dug a bit deeper and went back a bit further and I went to our annual reports. The first reference I could see came in our 2011 annual report where we made inquiries uh, with a, an external pr third party provider of mobile lithotripsy services wanted to be assured that their doses were optimised and DRLs set for X-ray guided lithotripsy. Later in the same report, we made a more detailed series of inquiries relating to a repeat CT scan of the same patient with different machines at different locations and challenged whether the exposures had been optimised. We found that one used a fixed MA, the other incorporated a protocol using AEC, but were assured that both were optimised with DRLs reviewed regularly. Later on in the 2013 annual report, we uh, made a note that we served a prohibition notice and two improvement notices. One of the notices referencing having no employer's procedures, no protocols or DRLs in place. Later on, we made a note or a comment in our 2016 annual report. While we see in most departments that DRLs are displayed in controlled areas, there seem to be a lack of understanding amongst radiographers how DRLs should be used and what to do when levels are consistently exceeded. I made a little note here from our inspection notes. 
We saw comprehensive evidence how DRLs had been adopted locally and saw DRLs displayed in each room. However, radiographers we spoke to seemed confused about what DRLs are and how they should be used. The DRL charts showed several different figures for many of the examinations listed and the range of figures may be adding to staff confusion. Discussions were had on the possibility of producing a simplified list of DRLs. Slightly more recently, a response to one of our improvement notices was that the Trust committed to producing locally reflective DRLs. Just last year, we served a, another notice uh, where there are a range of breaches of the regulations. One was in not adopting DRLs. And I think the final paragraph there was the important one. We weren't assured that the Trust had established or reviewed DRLs across the range of examination and exposures in diagnostic radiology, interventional radiology or cardiology, dental or theatre exposures. They had done so in CT, which was got them off the hook to an extent. An earlier example, and this one drawn from the, the last set of regulations was, um, and, and so the, I guess this is a nod in the direction of patient dose recording rather than DRLs, we, we made a note that there was a failure to record patient dose data on a mini C arm, um, failure to appropriately optimise exposures, but also made a note that the trust should ensure staff understand what DRLs are and how they are used in practice and provide assurance that any consistently exceeded DRLs will be detected. The final remaining two slides give, uh, I've called them good examples of how we've seen DRLs being presented. Um, other good ways of presenting DRLs are available. Um, so we've got two slides here. This is the first one uh, for CT. I'll take a little, maybe I'll take a little note to scan through the information that's there. Um, quickly down the examinations, this is just the first top uh, quarter or so of a, a very extensive list. Um, this is the uh, the dose survey results from one of two scanners. Um, there's several things that I like about this. The first is that they compared the local DRLs in 2018 with the previous survey results, the previously established DRLs where they can have a comparison. I like the way that they record the numbers of patients in each cohort for e each of the protocols. And of course they're comparing with the national DRLs as well where they can, which again uh, it is a very good practice and complies with the regulations. But this is just one scanner, not both. And so this is a room specific DRL. Again, in fact, from the same trust, these are uh, survey results and DRLs for an interventional radiology system. Uh, again, a, a, a single room. Uh, and again, it's just a, a selection of some of those which have been surveyed. I like the, that the DRL has been compared with the national value, even though IRMA doesn't require that for interventional radiology examinations. I like that they've clearly used some of the uh, same dose distribution to derive the, the local DRL to identify exposures for further examination of outlier high doses and, and possibly notifiable exposures. So I think they've, they've made more use of the same dose distribution that they've used to derive the local DRL in the first place. But, and while this is maybe food for thought, it's not connected to the main part of this the, this slide set, which is around setting DRLs. So, look, that's it. You're probably all fed up with listening to me. Don't blame you. Thank you very much. All the very best. Okay, thank you, Cliff. Um, just a reminder that we will be, uh, we, I am taking questions as we go through uh, and compiling the list of them all, so please keep them coming. Uh, they, are, they are making it through to us, we've had quite a few already. Uh, we're going to move straight away on to our next speaker, who is Paul Charnock from IRS, uh, and he's going to talk about the IPM report 88, which is all about DRL and dose monitoring. Hi, 
My name is Paul Charnock. I'm a medical physicist based in Liverpool and I'm the chair of the IPEM Report 88 Working Party on DRLs and Patient Dose Monitoring. This talk is to give you an update on the Working Party and a status of the report as it is at the moment. So what I'll cover in this talk is I'll just give an overview of the current report 88 and then I will go into some details of the composition of the working party and the people who we've got involved. Um, I'll then talk about the current plan of work that we're undergoing and I'll mention towards the end where we plan on going. So the current IPEM report 88 was published back in 2004 by IPEM but it involved collaboration between other professional bodies. So you have IPEM, you have the British Institute of Radiology, the Royal College of Radiologists, the National Radiological Protection Board, who are now Public Health England, and the College of Radiographers. The document itself was fairly concise and it covered, for looking at the contents page, we have framework for national diagnostic reference levels and then the bulk of the document, how to establish local diagnostic reference levels. There's a chapter on actions when local diagnostic reference levels are consistently exceeded. This is a phrase from Irma that we'll come back to, but also included are sources of national data and at the end in an appendix there is an example of diagnostic reference level implementation. So IPEM report 88, it's a very good document, still pretty relevant, however we have to accept that it was written back in 2004. This was before um, some of the methodology that we can potentially use today was available, for example um, the availability of mass data from dose management systems from RIS. The report doesn't consider some of the newer modalities, for example, hybrid imaging, and also some modalities that are mentioned, for example, interventional radiography. It suggests that it's not applicable to, for, to apply local DRLs to these types of imaging. There's also a little bit of confusion as to how to interpret the guidance. So all in all, we felt that it was a good opportunity to refresh this document, to update it to newer data collection techniques, newer modalities, and word things um, a little differently um, in order to, to help us help open it up to a newer audience. And so we formed the IPEM 88 Update Working Party. And for this working party we pulled people in with experience or expertise across a whole range of areas. I'll talk about some of these in a little bit more detail but overall we wanted to cover as many imaging modalities as we could. We wanted to cover different patient cohorts, we wanted to cover different methodologies of data collection and analysis that may be available we also wanted to make sure that we have the appropriate links to other working parties, other professional bodies, and also to ensure that what is written applies to all four countries of the UK. So in terms of imaging modality, we wanted to cover and make sure that we had people with experience and expertise in all of the following general imaging, computer tomography, fluoroscopy, interventional angiography cardiology, dental, imaging in radiotherapy, and although radiotherapy itself doesn't have diagnostic reference levels, they do have dose reference levels, and we thought it'd be a good opportunity to bring those into the current document. Likewise, nuclear medicine was not really included in the previous report, and Diagnostic reference levels do apply to nuclear medicine, so again, it was a good opportunity to bring that under the same umbrella. And of course, mammography. As well as the different modalities, there are also um, newer methodologies that have been implemented over the past few years. The original 
what I've called paper-based methodology. Although probably using a spreadsheet these days, it's still relevant for smaller hospitals. So we still want to include that as a methodology. But we've now got data dumps from radiology information systems. We can get information direct from the equipment. And many trusts are having dose management systems installed. So we want to make sure that the document covers these methodologies and that we have, again, people with experience and expertise to be able to write these sections. And in terms of patient cohort, there are already um, a couple of other working parties for adult patient dose audits. We've got the Public Health England National DRL Working Party, of which there's considerable overlap with our Working Party. But there's also the IPEM Paediatric Optimization Working Party. And again, we share a couple of members to ensure that any documentation that's produced is consistent. And just like the original Report 88, we have links with professional bodies. British Institute of Radiology, Public Health England, the Society and College of Radiographers, the Society of Radiological Protection, and we have direct link with CQC. However, in addition to the CQC, we also have links with the enforcing authorities for each of the other devolved administrations, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, and we also have at least one member from each of the UK countries. Okay, so that's a description of the composition of the working party and who we've got links with and, and what we're aiming to cover. But what's the overall aims of the working party? Well, we want a document that is clear and concise, just like the previous um, one was. Um, we want it to be straightforward. How do you establish local diagnostic reference levels? What do you do with local diagnostic reference levels? We also want to cover key definitions, especially those where there may be a little bit of confusion that we're aware of in speaking to the community that we really want to make clear. Differently to the previous document, which I think was pretty much aimed at the medical physics community. We want this to be readable, not just to the physics community, but to radiographers and employers as well. What we're not going to include this time is we're going to define national diagnostic reference levels, but we're not going to describe how they're determined. That's the remit of the PHE um, NDRL Working Party. We're not going to muddy the definitions with ICRP definitions or European differences. Uh, the UK has got a long established history of diagnostic reference levels. So we want to be clear how the majority of people understand diagnostic reference levels and typical values, how we are going to use them. And we're also not going to tell the readers how to optimise that is outside the scope of, of this document. We're going to point them in the direction of image optimization teams, but we're not going to tell them how to actually optimize. So one of the first things the working party did was to come up with a chapter or section structure. And this is how it stands at the moment. We may change it going forward, but we, we want to aim to keep it as simple as this. We want an introduction. And then we want nice, clear, concise chapters, how to do a patient dose audit, then how to set local diagnostic reference levels based on your patient dose audit. And finally, how to use local diagnostic reference levels. So I'll just talk through the plans for each of those chapters. So for the introduction, we're going to cover what the regulation says, what AMA says with regards to dose surveys, dose audits. Again, we want to have our key definitions and we're going to cover the role of image optimization teams and how they would fit into an audit program. But as um, I said earlier on, we're not going to um, tell the readers how to optimize.
we want the next chapter to be how to do a patient dose audit. So the aim is for this to cover what data to collect, how to collect it, what are the methods of data collection, what are the issues and potentially any troubleshooting that uh, we can help with collecting data, how to analyse the data and also what are the key differences between the modalities. We're aware that there's not going to be a one size fits all for the different modalities. So whereas we might have some general methodologies, we'll then have the key differences for each modality. The next chapter, once we've done our patient dose audit, is we want to say how to set local diagnostic reference levels. So how do you use the results of your survey, your patient dose audit, to set some LDRLs? What do you do when you've got no previous LDRLs to compare to? What if you get new equipment or you decide on a new technique or there is a change in either equipment or technique? How do you compare to national diagnostic reference levels? What do you do if there are no national diagnostic reference levels? And finally, we want a chapter or section to tell the reader how to use local diagnostic reference levels. How do you review them? What do you do if they are consistently exceeded? In fact, what is consistently exceeded? And also how not to use them. What is inappropriate use of local diagnostic reference levels? For example, application to single individual patients. We don't feel that's correct, so we'll explain that. OK, so there is an overall plan of what we were aiming to achieve. So where we're up to at the moment, as I said earlier on, we initially put together a structure and started writing text for that structure. Now, currently we have quite a lot of text. It's very useful, but there's a lot of repetition and a lot of inconsistency between the different writers. So the plan was to have small groups pulling this into a final structure. However, because of the current situation, we're actually taking advantage of this and we're having weekly meetings at the moment where we're reviewing the text, rewriting sections, removing inconsistencies and repetition, and also making key decisions on questions that are uh, being raised by the group. Two examples. First one, what's the frequency of dose audits? We're looking initially at three yearly for most modalities. However, it could be annual for certain high risk or for screening programmes. So for example, CT, perhaps the breast screening programme, we would recommend annual audits. We've also made a decision recently on sample size. So where we get data from um, a dose management system or a radiology information system, um, we're going to recommend that a sample size of 200 plus is appropriate to establish a local diagnostic reference level. But in the situations where you've only got lower amounts of data, um, small private hospital, infrequent exams, then there may be a case for cutting that to 20 plus for, for those samples. On both of these points, I think it's a good opportunity to say that we very much welcome feedback and questions from the community. We do have our links to the professional bodies and that's been really useful to raise questions, queries, to give us feedback. Um, however, I, my email address will be at the end of this and we very much welcome um, any additional thoughts. And lastly, what's the timeline for this? Well, we're hoping to have a near final draft towards the end of the year, but there's a very big caveat that depends on COVID-19. At the moment, we're managing to take advantage of this, like I said, and have our weekly meetings um, and to update the text. But as restrictions are lifted, it may be that a lot of the group um, are pulled in other directions, having to catch up on a lot of work that we've been unable to do in the current situation. We, we just don't know. Um, but I think towards the end of the year is a, is a good estimate. 
Okay, thank you very much for listening. I think that covers everything that I wanted to cover. Um, I need to acknowledge um, the rest of the working party, uh, whose names are on here. Okay, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm hoping as part of the working party that the uh, publication will clear up a lot of the confusion uh, around DRLs and also um, support people in, in actually setting uh, setting their monitoring programs up uh, and actually more me measuring the doses um, so that we can make sure they are optimum. Okay, we move on to our final speaker, uh, which is Maria Murray. And we're going to hear about what radiographers should know about DRLs. Uh, and this is a really important subject because there is quite a lot of confusion about what they're, they're due to be used for. So um, hopefully Maria will clear that up for us and then we'll have the live Q&A at the end. So keep your questions coming in for that. OK. Hello, I'm Maria Murray. I'm from the Society and College of Radiographers. And this is a talk specifically aimed at radiographers and what they should know about DRL's diagnostic reference levels. This is a one in a, in a series of DRL talks at this UKIO Congress. And I thank um, the organisers for inviting me to give this talk. I hope to better inform radiographers about what they should know about DRLs, how they should be using them, what to do if they wish to challenge their local DRLs, and that really that they're better informed generally about the typical doses they their, their patients receive whenever um, as part of their role in the medical sector. I'm assuming that radiographers, all of you will know that there have been there has been um the EU Basic Safety Standards Directive, and that this was transposed into IRMA in the United Kingdom, and that you have a general knowledge about IRMA within the United Kingdom. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So what's the issue with DRLs? Why do we have them? Well, the thing is that there's large variations in patient doses for the same examination across the various parts of the United Kingdom. And the patient dose optimisation, I think you'll know this, requires a combination of good radiographic technique and equipment performance. But DRLs are basically a simple tool for checking that patient doses are optimised. Now, in terms of the three elements of good radiation protection practice, justification, optimisation and limitation, DRLs sort of come in between optimisation and limitation, but they are not dose limits. And we should always remember that achieving diagnostic image quality should always be a higher priority than, than lowering the dose. It's all about answering that clinical question and having a good quality image, but also trying to keep the dose down. So ask yourself as a radiographer, do you ever check the exposure factors, the dose area products, say, for example? or whether your image is under or overexposed. If you do, then you're doing your job and that's good. And if you're not, then you're not doing your job and you should. So DRL definition within IRMA, um, it is the mean dose levels over um, certain examinations in diagnostic and interventional radiology, or indeed it's about radiopharmaceuticals in nuclear medicines and their level of activity. And it's important to note that these are for groups of standard sized individuals, okay? So that there should be a local DRL review process and if you don't know that for your department, find out. And the review process is a way of evaluating whether the amount of radiation used in a representative sample of patients 
for that defined um, clinical examination, say, for example, a CT head, is it higher or lower than is required as part of the optimization process? So basically, DRLs are a standard for comparison, quite simply. Watch what you compare, though. Remember that there are different units, but also different pieces of equipment. So when you are doing comparisons between local and national DRLs, it's really important that you compare like with like. What this really means is that DRLs are a level used in medical imaging routine conditions, and it's about looking to see if the dose that you have given patients are unusually high or unusually low for a particular procedure. And it goes without saying that higher doses means that there's a higher radiation risk, and lower doses mean, may mean that your image quality might not be sufficient for that clinical task, that clinical question. Optimization is a fundamental task of a radiographer. We are the patient guardians after all, and it's us that give the dose to patients. Most DRLs are cited for anatomical sites, but we will be moving more to clinical DRLs, say, for example, for stroke patients or whatever. One thing to stress, DRLs are not a dose limit and they are, do not apply directly to individual patients or examinations. So compliance with IRMA. Now, IRMA is where DRLs are compulsory. Um, the regulations are here and your employer must do the following. Make DRLs available to operators and regularly review them. Regulation 6. Ensure that a medical physics expert is appointed and involved in the measurement and the dissymmetry around DRLs. Uh, you need your medical physics expert here. Uh, hopefully, you will know who that person is and make friends with them. There must be appropriate reviews and action undertaken whenever DRLs are consistently exceeded. So this isn't just about one patient, it's over a period of time. But you as the radiographer should be keeping an eye on this and reporting if they are consistently exceeded because something isn't right there. There should be written procedures for exposures to include the use and review of DRLs. Now, your local IRMA procedures, you should know where those are. There should be at least 14 of them, and they should be a, a, a part round about DRLs. And operators, practitioners must be trained in the use of DRLs. That goes without saying, and whenever they are updated or changed, Operators and practitioners should be made aware of that. There's a new regulation from the old IRMA. Uh, regulation 13 is about departments collecting dose estimates for typical patients, for typical pieces of equipment, and sending them to Public Health England whenever that's requested. More about that in a minute. So LDRLs or local D DRLs normally should be reviewed at least annually or up to two years, but really they should be reviewed if they're consistently exceeded. Regulation 12, remember, in IRMA is all about optimising every exposure, and that is the role of the radiographer here. Um, and if there are no DRLs for a typical examination that you're delivering, um, optimization of that examination must still be taken. So when the local IRMA inspector comes to visit, what is he or she looking for and what should radiographers know about with DRLs? Well, first of all, they should be established, they should be used in practice, and they should be reviewed and there, there should be a written documented local process for this and that DRL should be documented somewhere and easily available for everyone to see.
So I've, I've put some questions up here on this uh, slide. I want you to be able to hopefully by the end of this talk know the answers to them. But if you don't, then you need to do some more CPD. Do you really understand the importance of DRLs? Do you know who's responsible locally for managing them? Are there DRLs for adults and children, paediatrics, visible within your department? Do you know why there's a difference between national and local DRLs? And do you know the process of what you should do if you keep exceeding the DRL for a particular examination on a particular piece of equipment? And if you ask yourself this question, we're always too busy, um, and do we legally have to? Yes, we do. Um, and does each patient dose need to be below the local or national DRL? No, it doesn't, and hopefully you'll, you'll find out the reason. And do DRLs apply to planning scans and, and radiotherapy, so CT planning scans? Yes, they do, but they're not known as diagnostic reference levels. They are known as dose reference levels. I want to give you some background here about where DRLs first came from. So the United Kingdom has actually got a very good track record in measuring um, doses given to patients. We've got over 20 years of it, and they were first survey nationally was done in 1985 with the then Health Protection Agency, which is now known as Public Health England. The link is at the bottom there from this report, which is very makes good reading. And then there were reviews done every five years. Um, and what we found was that there was better optimization and it included regular monitoring of patient doses. So that's a really good thing. And that the average percentage dose reduction that was seen in between these five-year intervals, the dose reduction was between 10 and 20%. That's good for patients, but also it's good in terms of our practice. And we're still able to be able to answer that clinical question by reducing the dose to patients. Two very important documents of which I've given you the links to these at the end of the talk, ICRP from 1990, and the, the yellow one is the European Commission Report 185 on the use of DRLs. Both make interest in reading. Do go and have a look at them. Also, um, there's a really good website called Eurosafe Imaging, and they have a call for action around DRLs, and the action is number two and four, one about having DRLs for adults and children. These should be updated, so this, remember, is around the whole of Europe, and promote dose management systems to establish local, national, and European DRLs. Dose management systems are being slowly introduced in the United Kingdom, and that your local medical physics experts could be using them. And if they are, go and find out what they do with them. It's a really quick and easy way to collect all that dose information from your local practice. I would recommend that you go and look at this, this website. So when we're talking about DRLs and typical patients, what do we actually mean here? Well, in terms of adults, it's looking at adults who are typically within this weight range. Now, we know that across the United Kingdom, patients' weights are increasing all the time. But at the moment, we define it as an average of between 70 kilograms plus or minus 5 kilograms. And when we're talking about children, at the moment, DRLs are cited as in age ranges. But we're moving more and more to weight categories. And if you image paediatrics at all, you should be weighing every single one of them before you expose and recording that weight. That should be included in those collection of dose estimates that are then sent to Public Health England that then will in future inform um, better or, or future DRLs. It is important that you know that these are 
the typical patients here, but also at the moment, the children DRLs, the paediatric DRLs are still cited in age, but we're trying to move to weight, so please do that. What do we mean by the DRL quantity value? Now, a, a, a really useful IPEM document is Report 88. It's being updated at the moment. Uh, I'm on the working party for our organisation, um, but it will be useful for you to go and look at it, speak to your medical physics expert about this. But when we talk about local DRLs, we are really talking about the median of the dose distribution of doses that you give for a particular uh, piece of equipment and over a range of patients, not one individual patient, okay? And that when we talk about national DRLs, these are norm always cited as the 75th percentile or third quartile, either way. And the graph is quite clear here. Um, so really when you talk about exposing your patients, you want your dose that you're given to generally be below that third quartile, quite simply. But sometimes your exposure might be above that third quartile, and that's okay if there's a particular reason for it, okay? So remember, good optimization is trying to keep the dose down, but still producing a quality image to be able to answer the, the question. And that multiple facilities give you a national DRL, and just a few facilities will give you the local DRL. So perhaps you work in a trust of several hospitals, that will be your local DRL. Um, and doses that consistently are above the third quartile, it's important that you note these, report them, and that an investigation with your medical physics expert is undertaken because that should not be happening. So the dose quantities we use in setting DRLs, and it's really important that you know these so that you know what you're looking at when you're checking your local DRLs. In general radiography is the entrance surface dose or the dose area product, and the units are there, ESD as milligrays or DAP as gray per square centimetre. In CT, it's always you know, measured in CTDI vol or dose length product. In mammography, mean glandular dose is the typical quantity. Fluoroscopy will be in time, as well as DAP, which is dose area product. And in radiotherapy plans, these are dose reference levels um, in terms of CT and the scan length, etc. Et so ensure you know these units of measurement. Ensure that your local DRLs that you have uh, available to you as operators within your local department have the same units so that you're comparing like for like. Now, you may as a radiologist be thinking, but I, I use automatic exposure controls. Yes, okay, but you should also know about each of these units of measurement and the typical DRLs for your examinations. Do not rely on automatic exposure controls because uh, they might not have been properly calibrated, etc., etc. Uh, know the doses, work with your medical physics expert and um, make sure that when you're teaching students that it's not just about automatic exposure controls, it's about these. Now, Kamari 16 had a recommendation about, and this was about the use of CT, uh, about having a local image optimization teams. And these teams should be made up of radiographers, medical physics experts, um, radiologists. Now, if you have one, find out what's happening with them. What do they do? They're normally involved in the review of those reference levels. And uh, if you don't have one in your local department, ask to get one set up, 
because they're really good. Now, the, the DRLs that we should be working with UK-wide are the ones produced in 2019 for each of these um, types of procedures. The link is there. Download this. It's only about five or six pages. Make sure that your local DRLs are informed by these national ones that you can compare and that the units of measurement are, are really important to get that right. Now, there may well be some reasons why your local DRLs do not compare well with the, the national DRLs. Could be down to operator error, could be down to poor equipment performance or the methodology used to measure them. If that is the case, Please make sure a review is undertaken locally. Again, inform your medical physics expert and work with them. Um, and as I've mentioned before, each of these DRLs are, are, are cited as anatomical areas, but we're moving more away to clinical DRLs. Some misconceptions about DRLs, they're not for individual patients. Um, they're not a dose limit, uh, they're not for individual examinations, and there's an assumption that being below a DRL always means good practice. No, because yes, it's good practice if the image has been optimised, but still answers the clinical question. There's no point in having this dose really down if the image isn't good enough to be able to answer be able to answer the question and then it has to be repeated and you've given the patient more dose. And there's this misconception that you don't need to be involved in the collection of national population dose surveys from Public Health England, but you now know that you do. Public Health England are not insistent at the moment. They are still expecting departments to do it as part of very good practice. So in summary, I want you to go back to slide number seven on this talk and make sure you know the answers to those questions. I hope that you will know why you have local DRLs and national DRLs and what's the difference between the two of them. You must know the units of measurements that are being used for different DRLs. You should know the employer's responsibilities and your own responsibility in terms of compliance with IRMA. You know now what the misconceptions are in terms of DRLs. And if there's an image optimization team, IOT, get involved or find out what they're doing because they are the ones that collect the dose data that help to inform future DRLs. So go back to your department, please read the documents and the links that I'm going to be giving you. Know where your local DRLs. Make sure that if you do image children that these DRLs are quite separate than the adult DRLs. And that make sure that you're comparing like for like, that you do use the units of measurement. And one thing I will stress is when you are teaching and assessing student radiographers, it should involve a discussion around DRLs. Um, so go and do some extra CPD, my advice to you. I've done plenty and I've given you loads of web links um, in, in a minute. Watch out for this report being updated. Um, talk to your medical physics expert. Loads of website links, please use. Also, my colleague and I within the Society and College have produced four radiation protection webinars, which are free of charge to members. We've written loads of guidance documents. that I've made freely available to everyone. Please go and read them.
Okay, so could I give, before we move to the Q&A, could I give a really big thank you to our three speakers, uh, Cliff Double, Paul Charnock, and Maria Murray. Um, the, because of the, um, the current situation we're in, we asked them to produce these uh, talks and, um, and presentations at really short notice. So um, I, I want to give them a really big thank you uh, for managing to do that and do it so well. Okay, we're going to move on to the Q&A uh, section now. There's a few questions that I'm going to pick up. We've dealt with some of them as we've gone through. Um, so I'm going to start off with a question that came, I think, from Jim Weston about um, the definition of acceptable uh, image quality. Um, and what I would suggest is that actually uh, the IPM publication won't address optimization uh, at all. You still need to do it, but it won't address it. And the best people to decide what the acceptable level of image quality is are the people that um, are actually reporting the images, whoever that is, whether it's a radiologist, radiographer, cardiologist. Um, so I would suggest that you approach that through some form of image optimization team. That would be the best uh, approach for that. Um, do you want to add anything to that, Paul? No, I think you've you've covered that right. It's key that it's um, the optimization is a multidisciplinary task. It involves radiologists, radiographer, and medical physics experts. Okay. Uh, any of the panel want to come in? I wouldn't dream of telling uh, clinical people about their optimization. I just want to know that it's gone through a process, and preferably within an image optimization team in the way that's been described tonight. Okay. So we'll move on to another question uh, from Julius. Uh, about DRLs not being enforced in paediatrics. Um, and Cliff, this one has, uh, I think this one's got your name written all over it. Would you like to respond to Julius? I couldn't see all the question. Can you read it out exactly? Yes, so it's, a, it's about the fact that DRLs are perhaps not being enforced in paediatric radiology at the minute. Um, and I certainly know you've had a, an, expect, uh, an inspection program around paediatric hospitals. So um, I certainly know that part of that isn't true, but um, perhaps, Julius, you want to uh, let us know which department you're based in, and perhaps we could send Cliff to send you to give you a visit. Cliff, do you want to comment? Well, well, only that, uh, of course, we do take enforcement action, and it's a, a complicated beast when we do it and what, what sort of thresholds we adopt. Um, but we have taken enforcement action, um, 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 of course. We'll continue. I think we've lost Cliff. Okay, we'll, we'll carry on. We, we need a lot, uh, oh. a lot of confidence that the uh, exposures have been optimised and that DRLs have been appropriately set. So um, I'm, I'm not sure I will okay. go along with that. Thanks, Cliff. Um, me, but, um, we'll move on to another question happy, now about low numbers. Yep. What do you do if you've got very low numbers? Uh, and I would certainly say if for a particular examination your numbers are, are so small that, that statistically you can't uh, measure whether you're compliant with a DRL, then um, I would suggest you probably don't need to set one for very, very low numbers. Um, again, would any of the panel like to, to add to that? I think that's pretty straightforward. I mean, um, Maria here, I, I suppose I would want to know what the, the national DRL would be for that particular examination. Uh, so it's not a case of you don't I, I would to agree. know what the DRL is locally. Yeah. You should be looking at it nationally. So, uh, yeah, I think the question also was, uh, I think there was something like six a year. If you only do six of something a year, then it's yeah. probably not worth uh, doing too much with the data other than checking that it's it's not a million miles out, but really any any sort of statistics uh, isn't really po uh, possible with that. Um, we'll move on to another question now from William, uh, who essentially is asking, are there going to be any um, imaging dose indexes in the uh, IPM report 88 publication, so the <laughs> EI values or any of the other um, indicators that tell you what the exposure was to a particular uh, detector. So, Paul, do you, would you like to take that one? Yeah, um, I mean, those indicators are giving you the essentially the dose to a detector, so it's not really a patient dose indicator. And that's not to say that they're not relevant in terms of optimization. 
really when we look at patient dose audits, you want to pick the relevant dose parameter for that imaging modality, such as dose area product, dose length product, administered activity, etc. Okay, thank you. Um, so then there's a question about uh, about dose management systems from uh, Paul Connolly, um, and I think Paul's comment really is about the fact that um, the manufacturers are selling dose management systems with lots and bells and whistles, uh, and do the panel think that perhaps some of the best bells and whistles are detracting from the main purpose of them, which is really to to support dose monitoring and optimization? Um, and I'll, I'll come to the rest of the panel in a moment, but my personal view is that I think some of the bells and whistles are a distraction. Uh, certainly in Nottingham, we, we have an awful lot of systems connected to a dose management system, but actually the, the, the basic data is what we're really using uh, mostly for our work. And I think it's really important that you do use the system to actually get a measure of what are your current patient doses and to report that regularly. And that's, that's really, really important. Um, so I don't know whether any of the other panel would like to, uh, to to add to my comments there. For me, Matt, okay. you've got more um, experience than the right. So I'm just, just going to scroll down as some system. questions and become uh, I'll, I'll uh, some quite quickly. You up, uh, um, to quiz you. So, I'll try and take. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to leave that I'll one. I'll try and take them as I can read them. Uh, Caroline, Caroline Finlay, Matt asks a very important question that a lot of read offers would ask. Okay, it's about yes, so, yes, we'll, uh, yeah. Move to that one. Yeah. So. Uh, so the, the question is, in IPM report 88, why are uh, local DRLs defined as the mean of the room means, while the NDRLs are defined as the third quartile? Uh, I don't know whether, Paul, you'd like to take that one? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so when you do a, a local audit, you want to essentially establish a, a typical dose. What, you know, what is a typical dose for a typical patient? that goes through your room, through your department. At a national level, they're collecting data from hundreds of systems um, with different technologies, um, more variables um, in terms of slight changes in protocol. And so to give an indication of what is a, an acceptable dose in the UK, a third quartile is slightly more appropriate. Does that answer, I think? Um, yeah, I think I think they're doing different things, really, aren't they? I think the the purpose of the national DRL um, is really to say, well, you know, we we look at the range of systems as you, as you said, uh, and to highlight where we think that the um, the practice shifts from good practice to uh, practice that needs to be perhaps looked at or optimised. And I think it's a, it's a fairly blunt tool, really. I mean, the seventy fifth percentile uh, was probably just uh, you know, was chosen to say, well, that the worst quartile probably need to think about their um, their uh, doses and optimise. So they might have old equipment or they might have poorly optimised practice. Um, when It's interesting, when you actually get to a situation where most of the systems are optimised, then the third quartile uh, isn't a good measure anymore because it's a bit like the um, the frog crossing the road, you know, where it, where you cross uh, halfway across the remaining portion of the road, and, and you never get there. So if we keep using the third quartile, then eventually uh, the doses would be zero, and that's clearly not possible. So certainly at this time in mammography, where nearly all of the systems used for screening, um, in fact, all of the systems probably are optimised, actually the third quartile wasn't chosen. So um, statistically, it, it's really just the number when the doses are, are varying quite widely, and they still are in most modalities, it's really a blunt tool to choose the level at which people should take action. So hopefully that answers uh, that question. Okay, uh, I'm just scrolling down some of the uh, some of the questions now. Um, yeah, uh, the progress towards uh, clinical DRLs. I certainly think that the um, a, a quite a number of the national DRLs now are set with a clinical definition to them. So I think we are moving to that more and more. 
Um, certainly, the last two CT reports have been based on clinical definitions for the um, for the uh, national DRLs. Uh, yeah, so um, there certainly are available guidelines for DRLs in mammography. They're quite um, widely shared, um, and they're all on the um, they're all on the uh, PHE uh, part of the government website. So if you search for National DRL UK, you will find the right site, and it's certainly been in two of the speaker's slides already. So if you want to find the, the actual web link there. Um, right, what else have we got? Uh, <laughs> I think somebody's asking one of the speakers to write their policy on DRLs. That's quite a nice way to get your uh, radiation protection support done. Uh, okay, uh, there's a question about testing uh, significance. Uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, so Mike is asking about um, uh, twice the standard error of the mean. Um, I think there is a danger with um, checking whether your doses are above and below DRLs that you, you use too, much, too many statistics, or setting your DRLs, you use too many statistics. I think there's an error of judgment when you actually set them. There will not be, in the end, um, a precise formula um, to actually set them. I think, I think there's an element of judgment needed when you do that. Would you like to come in on that, Paul? Um, I mean, that, that's one of the areas that we're sort of discussing and pulling apart at the moment. Um, if we do move to median, uh, as we move to median, you can use the standard error on the median as well. There's a slightly different formula for that. But yeah, um, I mean, within the guidance itself, although we want to guide, we want to leave a scope for a bit of professional judgment within the MPE. Okay, so um, I think we've covered pretty much all of the questions uh, in, in, that have come through so far. Um, some of them are on similar lines, so I'm not going to go to those. Um, I'm perhaps just going to ask the, the, the speakers in the end if, the, if there's any particular questions they would like us to pick up um, before we close. They're all frantically reading them now, as you can probably see. <laughs> No, it, well, I, I think uh, I think what we'll do then is uh, we'll we'll wrap up the session. So um, again, I want to say a really big thank you uh, to Maria, Paul, and Cliff for putting together their presentations under under duress from from me, uh, and also to thank the uh, UK IO team, particularly Julie, for um, keeping us to task on this. Uh, and thank you all for um, staying with us. Uh, there's been a really good turnout this evening. And do check the UKIO website for some of the future present, uh, future sessions that are up and coming. So, uh, so thank you very much, and, and good evening, everyone. Thanks.